Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's now time to introduce our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight Malia Smith, EDD. Dr. Malia Smith graduated from Kamehameha Schools in Honolulu, going on to receive a BA and master's in corporate communication and a doctorate in education from the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where she graduated with distinction. Currently, she is the owner, president of Sustainable Ideation, LLC, which has been contracted to provide sustainability solutions, research, and reports for groups like the OHA, OHA, and the Hawaii Department of Agriculture. Dr. Smith has an extensive background in education, administration, strategic planning, and sustainable development, and has provided services to various organizations, schools, political candidates, and government agencies. She also owns and operates I Love Nalo Store and Wellness Center which features contemporary vegan versions of traditional native Hawaiian dishes such as Lao Lao and is also a healing center in Waimanalo on the island of Oahu. Her presentation tonight is entitled Food Sovereignty, The Power of Food. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Malia Smith. Well, aloha everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to your event. I'm truly honored to be here and I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to share with you my journey as the owner of a vegan uh, wellness center in Waimanalo. But before we get started, I want to ask you a question. How many of you are vegan or vegetarian already by your show fans? Oh my gosh, that's like almost everybody. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to be preaching to the choir, right, tonight. That's awesome. Okay, I have another question. How many of you are vegan or vegetarian and Native Hawaiian? Okay, two people out of the whole audience. And honestly, I am not surprised by that because the majority of Native Hawaiians are not vegan or vegetarian. And that's an interesting fact. But my question is, why? Why have so many Native Hawaiians, and people of Hawaii for that matter, adopted the standard American diet, the SAD diet? The diet that was rated a one out of 10, one being the worst. <laughs> it is the lowest for health according to the US Department of Agriculture. The diet that contains high levels of heme, which is a type of iron that is linked to colorectal and breast cancer. The diet, according to two Harvard studies, increases one's risk of dying from pancreatic cancer and heart disease by upwards of 72%. And the diet that attributes to the reasons why Mayo Clinic says that nearly 70% of Americans take at least one prescription drug every day. Why are Native Hawaiians and the people of Hawaii willing to risk their health, their lives, and their people for food, the worst type of food? Why has Spam Musubis and canned Vienna sausage and Portuguese sausage and corned beef hash become a staple for us? Why did Hawaiians, and when did Hawaiians, start adding large chunks of pork and fat into their perfectly healthy lao laos. You know, throughout my life, I have seen many of my family members and friends die from chronic illnesses. Both my grandparents, Native Hawaiian, died of cancer. My sister and many of my aunties, uncles, and cousins have diabetes or have died from diabetes, from kidney disease to heart disease to obesity you name it, my Native Hawaiian family has had it. But why, why so prevalent among Native Hawaiians? Well, it was about five years ago when I started to really think about these questions and issues about the health and well-being of my people. At the time, I was a professor and the assistant dean for the general education program at Hawaii Pacific University. And I was working on integrating the Hawaiian culture, that's me in the corner there, 
in the Lo'i, I was integrating Hawaiian culture and sustainability courses in the gen ed curriculum. And I was working also as the board president for a nonprofit called Sustain Hawaii. And I was writing a large secondary research paper for the Department of Agriculture about Hawaii's food system. And I noticed that the deeper that I got into the research about our culture, about sustainability practices, and our food system, the more I realized just how sick my people and the people of Hawaii and even the people in the world have become. And I have to say, some of the research was staggering and astounding. For example, in a 2004 Hawaii Diabetes Report, Native Hawaiians were listed as having the highest diabetes mortality rates. And in a 2015 Center for Disease Control and Prevention Report, the age-adjusted prevalence of diabetes was significantly higher for Native Hawaiians and type 2 diabetes disproportionately affected Native Hawaiians as compared to whites, with a more than two-fold higher prevalence and an earlier onset of 10 years on average. Moreover, the data also indicated that Native Hawaiians were younger, they had lower education levels, and higher BMIs. Also, according to a 2017 Office of Hawaiian Affairs Native Hawaiian Health Fact Sheet, 75.7% .7 of Native Hawaiian adults were considered obese and overweight. That's three-fourths of our population. Public high school students that are Native Hawaiian, obese and overweight, 33.5%. What about adults who consume fruits and vegetables? Well, 73.8% of them do not. What about public high school Native Hawaiian students? They do not consume fruits and vegetables at least five times per day. 80.6% of our kids. What about these Native Hawaiian public high school students who do not have breakfast every day? 72.6%. These data were so alarming that I just had to take notice. I also discovered through my research that at least 85 to 95% of all chronic ailments are directly attributed to non-genetic factors like diet. So what does that mean? Well, according to Dr. Michael Greger, that means most deaths in the US are preventable. And they're usually caused by what we eat. So for the most part, diet is the number one cause of premature deaths and disabilities. Well, it was then that I realized well, how crucial food played in our health and quality and well-being of life. And I started to realize that all the food that Native Hawaiians, as well as the people of Hawaii, that were, have grown to love were actually killing us. Aside from the food, I also discovered that economics played a role. For example, highly Native Hawaiian populated areas like Nanakuli, where I grew up, Papakoleo, Waianae, and Waimanalo, where I currently live, are considered to be food deserts, meaning places that are fraught with fast food restaurants, liquor and convenience stores, and small markets that sell limited amounts of organic food options. These establishments typically sell cheap, unhealthy foods like spam musubi, plate lunch, cupcakes, donuts, chips, soda, sugary snacks. And make no mistake about it, these cheap and unhealthy foods are directly correlated to obesity heart disease, cancer, and diabetes, all the ailments that are killing Native Hawaiians in disproportionate numbers. With Native Hawaiians having the lowest mean family income compared to all ethnic groups in the state, it's no wonder they hold one of the highest disease rates in Hawaii. And compounding that disparity is Hawaii's highest cost of living in the United States. Food is one of the top expenses for families in Hawaii after housing and transportation. So if health is to be achieved for today's Native Hawaiian community and the other residents of Hawaii, interventions must connect health to nutritious foods and the financial means to be able to achieve it. Consequently, as I continued to dig deeper into the research, I realized from a triple bottom line perspective that the US food system was posing many problems, such as ecological issues related to pollution, energy, waste, 
and biodiversity? What about social issues related to food insecurity, public health, food safety, and labor issues? And then economic problems, such as policies related to operational favoritism for high-income farmers, loss of financial wealth among local and regional farmers, and high costs of hidden externalities. Ultimately, I realized that we had a systemic problem on our hands, and to truly understand the power of food and its far-reaching impact, we needed to look at the entire system holistically. And in doing so, we discovered that the concept of food sovereignty could provide a unique approach to this problem. Food sovereignty seemed like a viable answer. And now I know what you're thinking, sovereignty, ooh, that's kind of like a sensitive word there, one that has triggered many emotions and conversations and protests and even arguments. But food sovereignty is something a little bit different, and let me explain that to you. There's two definitions of sovereignty. One is the authority of a state that governs itself, which is the concept that we're most familiar with. The other definition of sovereignty is supreme power or authority. And in the case of food sovereignty, we use the second definition, meaning to have the independent power and authority over your own food choices. This food-related concept surfaced a few years ago, and it was forged by, guess what, indigenous people, rather than professional policy think tanks and academicians. This concept was first introduced by Lavaya Campesina at a 1996 World Summit organized by the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. Lavaya Campesina focused on the small farmer's rights to produce food, which is often depressed by many national and international agricultural trade policies and regulations. They explained that food sovereignty gives people the right to define their own food and agriculture. It is a food-related concept that requires collaboration, it considers the environment, it promotes local production, it centers on the importance of nutrients, and it integrates the values of social justice and equity. In the forum discussion at a 2007 International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty, the participants defined six principles exemplifying a food sovereignty holistic approach, which by the way is inseparable and it must be applied together. The six principles of food sovereignty include number one, focusing on food for all people. Food sovereignty supports the right to sufficient, healthy and culturally appropriate food for all individuals, for all people and for all communities and it rejects the notion that food is just another commodity or a component for agribusiness. Number two, food providers must be valued. The concept of food sovereignty supports the contributions and respects the rights of women, of men, of small-scale farmers, and indigenous people who wish to cultivate, grow, harvest, and process their own food. Great concept. Number three, localize food systems. Food sovereignty connects food providers and consumers and puts them at the center of decision making on food issues. It protects providers from cheap food dumping in local markets. It protects consumers from poor quality and unhealthy foods. It curbs the development of food deserts and inappropriate food aids or food tainted with GMO. Number four, it provides opportunities for local control. Food sovereignty respects the rights of local food providers and gives them control over their own territory, over their own land, their water, and their seeds. They're given opportunities to share their food in socially and environmental sustainable ways, which conserves diversity, and it also promotes positive interactions among food providers from different regions, territories, and areas. Number five, it builds on knowledge and skills. Food sovereignty builds on the local skills and knowledge of the food providers and it utilizes indigenous wisdom in conserving, developing, and managing localized food production and harvesting systems. 
they also engage in appropriate research endeavors to support these practices to be passed on for future generations. And finally, they work with nature. Food sovereignty uses methods that maximizes the contribution of nature and ecosystems while improving resilience and adaptation. It seeks to heal our planet by rejecting methods that harm our ecosystem or use destructive practices that damage the environment and contribute to global warming. You know, once I learned about food sovereignty and this concept, I couldn't help think about our native Hawaiian ahupua'a system, the system that allowed for millions of native Hawaiians to flourish and to thrive in a community-based concept and model like our ahupua'a system. They seemed so in sync, those two concepts. Somehow I felt the answers to some of our health problems here in Hawaii were clandestinely buried beneath the wisdom in our ahupua'a system and the concept of food sovereignty. But how could we integrate these things and these models and these terms? And what were some of the barriers of implementing such a model as this? Well, being the academician and the nerd that I am, I went back to empirical data, but this time I coupled it with secondary and primary research to find the answers. And I thought to myself, if we could just develop a program that integrated the concept of food sovereignty and Hawaiian epistemology with evidence plant-based vegetarian or vegan food, then we certainly could help improve the health and well-being of our people in Hawaii. And so began my journey toward the creation of our I Love Nalo store and community wellness center. Now I remember the very day when my partner and I shared our ingenious idea of opening this healing wellness center in Waimanala with some of our business friends. We were so excited about the idea, telling them, yeah, 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 it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna integrate like Hawaiian modalities, um, healing modalities like Lomi Lomi and La'au Lapa'au. We're gonna have gardening classes. We're gonna have people come to the, the garden and they're gonna help us and we're gonna have cooking demos and we're gonna be on TV and, and we're gonna have concerts and events and speakers come and movie night and, and, and we're even gonna have a vegan menu. And they looked at us like, <laughs> Deer in headlights, they could not believe it. They were saying, uh, vegan, in Waimanalo, you not so what. Don't you know that uh, Waimanalo has mostly Hawaiians and Hawaiians don't eat like that? And that's what they told us. And at first, when they first told us, I was like, oh, I was so bummed. I was, I was disappointed because all I kept thinking was, ah, oh, fail, no, how can we fail? Especially with the type of evidence that we had collected. There's no way we could have failed. And, my ho and I had hopeful possibilities in my mind about our startup. And for some reason, I just couldn't take their advice at face value. Plus two, the research, like I said, was irrefutable. But maybe I was being a little overzealous, so we decided to hit the books once again and go back and gather more information, even more than we already collected, as well as hit the streets and talk to the people in the community about their eating habits. And interestingly, through our primary research, we actually discovered seven main reasons why people continue to eat unhealthy diets over healthier vegan diets. And here's what we found. Number one, they just don't know the facts about food, what's healthy and what's unhealthy. You know, we had one customer come into the restaurant telling us that his doctor said that he needed to eat healthier foods because he was fallen sick. So what did he do? He ate chicken ranch Caesar salads at fast food places. But he still continued to gain weight and he couldn't understand why. And he was asking us, why I'm eating salad? But little did he know that those salads were full of fat and unhealthy animal-based ingredients. Just because it's called a salad, which by the way, most of it is iceberg lettuce, which has very little nutrition, um, it does not mean that it is healthy, especially when they have chicken and bacon and ranch dressing and all that wonderful stuff. But honestly, how could he or many others know what's healthy or not, especially when research suggests that only one fourth of our medical schools in America offer a single class 
on nutrition. And the average time that a doctor will spend talking about nutrition with their patients is 10 seconds. That's it, 10 seconds. Also, many people have been told that their maladies are attributed to their genetics. So if grandma or your mom or your sister has diabetes or any chronic ailment, then probably it's inevitable that you're gonna get it too. Number two, and this is my favorite. They think vegans and vegetarians are weird. <laughs> There's an interesting misperception out there, let me tell you, and some of it is wild and crazy after interviewing some of these people. They believe that we're all granolas, that we live in cults, they believe that we smoke weed, they believe that we're, we hate non-vegans, uh, we don't eat enough protein, uh, we're desperate for attention, that was something that someone said as well. Someone even told us they think that we howl at the moon while we drink our kale smoothies and eat boring salads. That's the misperception out there and actually, that's not true because I'm pretty normal. <laughs> but, you know, the problem is truly a lack of social acceptance by their friends, family, and community. People get teased for being vegetarian or vegan. And honestly, it's just a lack of education and understanding. Number three, people think that vegan food tastes junk or that they don't know how to cook that types of meals or it just takes too long to cook healthy food. That's what I was told. Well, you know, that couldn't be further from the truth. And some of the best food that I've eaten has been vegan and it feels so good feeding my body the nutrients that it needs to thrive. And there is a big difference, let me tell you, there's a big difference between junk food and food that tastes junk. So taste is important, yes, and honestly, cooking vegan meals is just as easy or complex as any other type of meal. Creativity is the secret, for real. But we also found out through our research that a bad diet will definitely affect our physiology, including our taste buds. According to medical studies, a person's palate dulls over time based on the amount of unhealthy foods that they eat. For example, if someone contains or maintains a healthy diet, eating lots of fruits and vegetables and legumes, and then they go on vacation and they decide that they're gonna splurge and they eat all kinds of sugary snacks and high fat foods, their palate actually changes to the point where good foods no longer give them the same taste satisfaction that they once enjoyed. So what do they do? They begin to add more salt, sugar, and fats into their diet basically leading them down the path to an unhealthy diet causing sugar and fat addictions. Number four, that's not Hawaiian or local. That's not how locals eat, and that is not our culture. That's what we were told. But actually, that statement is totally false. The word for food in Hawaiian is ai, which also means to eat. But if you look at the deeper kauna, the hidden meaning, the word directly references kalo, fruits, and vegetables. Why? Because the primary diet of ancient Hawaiians was ulu, kalo, uwala, poi, and other fruits and vegetables. At one time, native Hawaiians very rarely ate meat, only on special occasions. And in fact, native Hawaiian women were forbidden to eat pork and several types of fish. So eating a plant-based, vegetarian or vegan diet is totally Hawaiian, at least way more than the canned processed meats, fast foods, and plate lunches that have been somehow been inaccurately an identifier of the Hawaiian people and culture. Number five, people including those who are advocates for saving our planet don't think that there's a direct connection between the health of our environment and eating a vegan diet. Did you know that when compared to the available calories produced between beef, produce, and grains, beef requires 160 times more land, 25 times more water, and it produces 11 times the amount of greenhouse gases. In one single year, over 20 million tons of synthetic man-made chemical fertilizers are used in the United States to support high-intensity monocrop systems where 50% of these fertilizers are absorbed by the plants and the other 50% are released into our atmosphere, 
affecting our waterways, our, our soil, and our air. A U.S. geological survey found that 70% of our public and domestic drinking water well samples were contaminated with either pesticides, nitrate, or other animal waste contaminants, which often contains pathogens, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, dust, arsenic, and dioxin. And over the past 10 years, just 10 short years, approximately 75% of our new infectious diseases that impact humans were caused by bacteria and viruses and other pathogens that are found in animal products and environmental contaminants. Number six, people think that they can eat anything if they exercise regularly. But the reality is, is you cannot exercise your way out of a bad diet. Food and exercise are a feedback loop. The better one eats, the more enthusiastic and more motivated they are to exercise, which then makes them want to eat more healthier. Many people will justify their unhealthy diets by saying, oh, I'll just burn off this extra piece of pizza later on at the gym. But truly, it doesn't work that way. When we use oxygen to burn the fuel in our bodies, we automatically produce what's called free radicals. This happens even if you live a sedentary life. However, if you ramp things up and you add exercise into your daily routine, which most of us do, your body creates more oxidative stress. But by eating antioxidant rich, rich foods commonly found in vegan diets like berries and nuts, our bodies can defend against these superoxide free radicals. And believe it or not, plant food contains 65 times more antioxidants than animal foods. For example, take a half a cup of red beans. That has 13,727 antioxidant units. What about a cup of blueberries? You're gonna get 13,427 antioxidant units. What about a handful of walnuts or pecans or hazelnuts? You're gonna get 5,000 95 units of antioxidants. Now let's compare that to animal plant-based foods. Chicken only has five units. Skim milk and eggs, four units. And a five ounce slab of salmon, you're gonna get a measly three units of antioxidants. With those kinds of numbers, it's no wonder why medical studies suggest that we should all be eating at least five servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. And finally, the seventh reason why people often choose an unhealthy diet over a healthy, healthier vegan or vegetarian diet is because they believe eating vegan is just too expensive. Initially, it does appear that eating local, organic, or plant-based foods um, are more expensive, but in reality, it's not when considering the long-term health costs and impacts upon people eating a standard American diet. According to researchers at Harvard Medical, the purchasing of plant-based foods actually offer the best investment for dietary health. By eating a vegan diet, which in turn optimizes one's health, helps to reduce costs tied to long-term illnesses and conditions and, require, and the requirements to use expensive prescription drugs and regular hospital and doctor visits. So think about it. Some, of health, some health insurers are willing to spend $8,000 on high-risk patients to participate in a nine-week health program in hopes that they learn how to lead a healthier life. Why do they do that? Well, it's because that would be a fraction of the cost for any ongoing care if that person got sick. Yes, eating a vegan diet does appear more costly, especially when compared to unhealthy, cheap, processed, canned, and fast food options. And it's important to note that it's estimated that one in six Americans can't afford to buy nutritious foods, which is disturbing and why bringing back people to the land and teaching them how to grow their own organic food is important. But my question is, what about those five people in that statistic who can buy nutritious foods? The reality is, is that most of them just don't. Do you know that three out of four Americans don't eat a single piece of fruit in a given day? Three out of four. Nine out of 10 don't reach the minimum recommended daily intake of vegetables. Also, 
96% don't eat at least three servings of beans per week. 98% don't eat at least two servings of orange vegetables per week. And 99% of Americans don't eat at least three ounces of whole grains per week. And most disturbing of them all is only one out of a thousand American kids ages two to eight made the cutoff of consuming less than 12 tablespoons of sugar every single day. That means 999 out of 1,000 kids consume 12 or more uh, tablespoons of sugar every single day. And by the way, this assessment was based upon a US dietary guidelines, the guidelines that allows for 25% of junk food to be a part of our accepted standard American diet. That seems absurd, right? That's crazy. How can they allow for one fourth of our diet to be junk food? How can that be acceptable? Well, perhaps it's because the US Dietary Advisory Committee includes members from candy companies and members from fast food organizations, as well as soda councils. That's right. They're the members that help to write the dietary guidelines for us Americans. We have businesses and people who have interest in this justifying their intent, insomuch that a fast food senior VP for marketing once said under oath in the court of law that soda was actually nutritious because it provides water, because that's the basis of that drink. Well, after gathering all this data, my partner and I realized that if we could address these issues while integrating the holistic approach of food sovereignty concept with the wisdom of native Hawaiian ahupua'a system, then we just might be able to create a program and a business model that could address some of the health needs of our community. And we knew that it was gonna require a systems-based approach. And after looking around, we realized the model didn't exist. Nobody was out there doing this. No one was integrating these very important ideas. So throwing all caution to the wind and ignoring the advice of our business savvy friends, we took the plunge. I quit my safe and comfortable job at the university and I dedicated my life to this mission. Our goal, to help people become healthier and happier one taste at a time. Our, well, our wellness center, just like we envisioned, includes yoga classes, we have lomi lomi, la'au lapa'au, we have poi pounding workshops, ho'oponopono classes, gong meditation classes, cooking demos, events, gardening classes, and yes, I'm happy to say even a full vegan menu. In Waimanalo. <laughs> We also, we also have integrated sustainability practices. For example, we use all non-toxic cleaning agents and products. We have a gray water system for our laundry area that actually feeds into our small collow patch. Um, we're a no straw zone. We made a commitment to sustainable coastlines, so we sell either metal straws or paper straws only upon the request of our customers. We bought reused materials to create our walls. We bought secondhand furniture, uh, and we even use compostable plates, utensils, and cups. Uh, we take the compost and our food waste to our 20-acre food forest farm where we feed our worms, and we transform part of the center into a natural regenerative garden using no pesticides, no herbicides, and no toxic chemicals. Besides implementing these ideas, we also started a program called Ha Ehu Ola, where we choose one person from the community. The criteria, they must be native Hawaiian, from Waimanalo, and they want to make a lifestyle change. We feed them two meals a day, six days a week, for three months for free. They're allowed seven lomi lomi sessions with practitioners with Ola Ikapono, and they receive Hawaiian la'au, lapa'au medicine. And they can also attend meditation classes for free with Sarah Dago at Sound Journey, which is hosted at I Love. We also go into their homes and we look into their cupboards. <laughs> we offer alternative vegan food options for them. We go shopping with them. Uh, we also invite them to our homes and we cook together 
with them. In fact, this past Sunday, we just had a Ha'i Ho'ola member go shopping with us, and then we went back to the home and we cooked four different vegan menus in two and a half hours. So we showed them how uh, quick and easy and simple it can be to be eating healthy. They also volunteer at the Food Forest Farm uh, with the intention of reconnecting to the Aina and Native Hawaiian cultural practices while exercising, we call it farm fitness. Um, upon the participants' graduation, after their three months are up, we encourage them to help to choose the next person so that they can, and it's usually a family or a friend, so that they can act as a mentor for the next participant. So the program has a built-in support system and uh, accountability measures embedded in it. Our entire team at I Love Nalo also shares their aloha and they're, and they're super supportive of our Ha'i Hu'ola members, giving them hugs and, and positive encouraging words, hitting them up on Instagram and all the social media. And this of course exemplifies our values there, which is aloha, ohana, kaya'ulu, laulima, and malama. This pilot program has been life-changing for all of us involved and we have had amazing results. For example, one gentleman in our program lost 26 pounds, which allowed him to become well enough to get the heart surgery that he so desperately needed. Another gentleman with kidney disease came to us in January. He told us that his doctor wanted to have him go into surgery in March to put a fistula in his arm to prepare him for dialysis starting in the summer. And knowing the gravity of his issue, I said, would you make a commitment to me and just by chance for the next three months, go full vegan and eat a full vegan diet. I will walk with you every step of the way. And he agreed to that and I thought, perfect. Well, he, three, went, three months went by and he went back to his doctor and the doctor was astounded by his results. He couldn't believe it. He was like, what are you doing? He said, I'm, I'm vegan. I've been eating vegan food for three months. And the doctor said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. His GFR went up nine points. It went from a 20 to a 29. And what that means is, initially his kidneys were functioning at 20%. But just after three short months with us, it went up to 29%. I am also happy to say that by eating a full vegan diet, he is no longer pre-diabetic. He was taken off of his statin drugs for high cholesterol. And most importantly, he did not have to get that fistula and he is not going to have to start dialysis. <laughs> and I'm super happy to say that now he's a vegan. <laughs> and He's almost 80, so you can teach old dogs new tricks. <laughs> we also had another gentleman that just graduated from our program. We call it graduation. Um, we've had, he's had some wild success as well. So here's a short clip of him sharing his story. Good morning, my name is Kyoki Frazier, and um, I was very fortunate and blessed to be part of the program with Malia and the staff at I Love Nalo. Um, it's such a blessing because like many Hawaiians, um, you know, I was on a path towards being unhealthy with respect to, um, you know, some of the chronic diseases that, you know, we f typically face, such as diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, heart attacks and stuff like that. So the program started for me in November. Um, it's been a blessing and it's been something that's helped me to, I think, develop the skills and the tools needed to forever change my life in terms of being on the path towards health and towards being overall um just in a better spot with respect to making choices and, and being physically active. So I was about 370 pounds when I started the program in November and I went to get a physical and my numbers were all pointing towards um, me being a diabetic. Uh, I was just at the point where I was pre-diabetic and uh, my cholesterol, high blood pressure and all that stuff was at all time high. In addition to that, I'm at work, just very stressed out, um, sleep wasn't great, had a hard time staying focused and um, staying attentive throughout the day. Um, and all of that changed after several months of eating the healthy vegan food and being part of the wellness programs that they offer at I Love Nalo. Um, I developed the skills and the tools to be able to know and plan meals. I've 
Malia has taught me how to shop and how to cook differently and to supplement with things that are more healthy, um, such as not eating rice, but eating millet, um, trying to incorporate more poi and natural foods that are not processed. Um, and I feel like I finally am on the path towards success. I've lost a bunch of weight. My numbers have reversed. I, my cholesterol is under control. My high blood pressure, my blood pressure is under control. It's at a good spot now, and I definitely want to keep that going. Um, I think the the best part about the program was not only developing, you know, specific things in terms of how to eat differently, how to think differently, understanding how, you know, politics and the societal effects of things play into, um, you know, health for um, groups of people that perhaps come from beginnings that are humble. Um, but most importantly, I was inspired to change. I have a belief in myself that I can do it. And I was shown the way from the staff and the program that I was blessed to be a part of at I Love Nala. So forever thankful to Malia and, and, and Lois and all the wonderful people that work at the restaurant or the wellness center. And look forward to continuing my journey as um, a Hawaiian that's going to be healthier and hopefully share my story with other people as well. So thank you very much. Aloha. <laughs> Keoki is, is so inspiring. I believe in total he lost over 50 pounds um, and he also has become a vegan starting June 1st. So we're pretty stoked on that. Um, so as you can see with the combination of our community-based ahupua'a system and the concept of food sovereignty along with the integration of a plant-based vegan diet, we were able to create a holistic systems-based healing model. We gathered support and currently collaborate with community members, leaders, and businesses who are committed to sharing their unique knowledge so that we can all help one another. For example, people like Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, Senator Laura Thielen, Representative Chris Lee, and Councilmember Ikaika Anderson have all been supportive of our efforts. Also, Mary Oneha and the people at the Waimanalo Health Center. Ellen uh, May and the folks at Waimanalo Job Corps. Denise Espana, and her team of teachers at Malama Honua Charter School. Ted Radovich, Dr. Radovich at UH Waimanalo Research Station. The Organic Farmers um, Co-op called Friends with Farms. And so many of others in Waimanalo have played a role in helping to heal and improve that community. As the old adage suggests, it truly does take a village. So to recap, and pull it all together, here's how we integrated all three factors that I just discussed in designing this healthy model. First, we started with the host culture, our native Hawaiian people and native Hawaiian epistemology. We framed our program around a 21st century ahupua'a model, and we centered on the goal to assist our community in remembering the importance of health and well-being, which are the core values of the Hawaiian culture. We also worked and continue to work to remind Native Hawaiians that prior to contact, our people understood health at its broadest definition. Disease prevention and health promotion was an integral part of our ancestors' lifestyle, primarily to ensure a long, productive life full of ehu ola, health and vigor. Secondly, we incorporated the concept of food sovereignty into our model, where we ensure that we build on local knowledge and skills. We value the food providers and our staff and respect all rights of all who grow, cultivate, harvest, and process their own food. We localize the food system, putting the providers and the consumers at the center of the decision-making process in order to protect consumers from poor quality, cheap GMO foods. We support the right to sufficient, healthy, and culturally appropriate food for all people and reject the idea that food is just another commodity. We work with nature by using methods that maximize the ecosystem and take measures to refrain from harming it. And finally, we respect the rights of local food providers and give them control and opportunities to share in socially and environmentally sustainable ways which conserves our diversity. Next, we took into consideration people's concerns about food and why, based on our research, they generally eat unhealthy diets over healthier vegan diets. We took into account the fact that people are underinformed and lack basic knowledge about healthy versus unhealthy foods. We analyzed their misperceptions about vegans and vegetarians. We took into account the fact that 
many people think plant-based meals are not very tasty. We also looked at the fact that many people believe that vegan food is not culturally aligned with our culture and it's not Hawaiian enough. We considered how people don't see the direct correlation to unhealthy, high animal product diets and the degradation of our environment. And we looked at how people sometimes inaccurately believe that a good exercise regimen will always offset a bad diet. And finally, we took into account how many believe it's just too expensive to eat healthily. So in creating our community wellness center, what we did was we kept these concepts and these concerns in mind, and here's how we addressed it. We provide workshops, trainings, cooking demos, ho'oponopono and gardening classes, yoga classes, poi pounding, meditation and lomi lomi services, uh, community events, as well as classes to build people's knowledge related to health and a vegan diet. To address people's misperceptions about vegans and the importance of valuing our food providers, we share our own personal stories. For example, I'm a local Hawaiian girl from Nanakuli, and now I live in Waimanalo, and I'm vegan, and I'm pretty normal. Looking at my staff also committed to our mission, 70% of them are Hawaiian and 86% of them are from Waimanalo. It's pretty cool, and they're pretty normal too. And um, we also love and value our employees and food providers so much so that we're gonna be establishing what's called an ESOP, or an Employee Stock Ownership Plan at the Wellness Center. So all of the people that work there will have stake in the business as well and become part owners. To address the concerns about the taste of vegan food and how to cook it, while also ensuring we localize and provide high quality foods, we have tested our menu over and over and over again and always aim to provide ono food. We try to buy as much local organic as possible in our ko'olau poko and our ahupua'a. We even buy from families within our community who have mango, ulu, or avocado trees in their backyards, just giving them an opportunity to make a little bit of money. We also have cooking demos, and we work with people in our Ha'i Huola program, teaching them how to incorporate vegan meals into their diet. To ensure that we provide food for all people, including Native Hawaiians, who sometimes believe vegan food is not Hawaiian enough, our menu includes vegan lao lao, vegan luau, tofu poke, which a lot of people tell us, how do you do that? It tastes like fish. It's tofu poke, poi, and my grandmother's mango bread recipe, which is made with our house-made ulu flour from my dad's ulu tree, which we cut, dehydrate, and make into our own flour. We also provide many different flavors from all types of people and cultures, from our medi bowl and barbecue porto sandwich to our buddha bowl, which includes wakame, kimchi, and salty vegetables. Another component of the program is that we work with nature to ensure that our practices don't harm our earth. So we use all compostable, reuse, non-toxic materials. Um, our garden is regenerative, so we don't use any fertilizers or pesticides, and we take our food waste up to the farm to feed our worms. To address concerns about exercise, we also provide volunteer opportunities where people can come to the farm and work getting their exercise while learning from and reconnecting to the aina. And then finally, we address people's concerns about the cost of eating healthier by teaching them how to grow their own fruits and vegetables through classes. And we just added a small store to our center so that people of Waimanalo can come and buy healthier snacks and food options in their own community without having to leave. We will also be providing recipes in the store and for our Waimanalo community, we will be creating a membership card for them so that they will be able to receive large discounts on these vegan snacks and foods so that it will be more affordable for them. All in an attempt to give them opportunities for local control, authority, and power over their own food choices. So overall, our wellness center is about empowering people using a holistic, systemic model, a model that is reflected in this poetic olelo no eau, which epitomizes great wisdom. Ke malama pono ya ke ola kino, he ehu ola ke kino no kava lo ihi o ke ola ana, which means when we keep our health in good condition, our bodies will have vigor for a long time in our lifetime. Yes, today's disposable lifestyle combined with over a century of colonization and dispossession has left many Native Hawaiians 
struggling to live a life of ehu ola, of health and vigor. But by reconnecting our people to the ahupua'a system, as well as give them the power and the authority over their own food choices and the rights to healthy and culturally appropriate foods, as indicated in the concept of food sovereignty, we believe it is a step in the right direction toward a healthier life for not only Native Hawaiians, but all people of Hawaii. After completing all of our research and seeing the positive results over the last three years, we are confident that we are on to something great. From providing our bodies with optimal nutrients to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that eating a plant-based vegetarian or vegan diet is the number one choice that we can make to improve our personal and global health. Through our mission, we have come to understand the power of food and its impact upon our ecological, sociocultural, and economic well-being. Food sovereignty, coupled with Hawaiian epistemology and a vegan diet, provides a unique approach to healing our communities. Through its culturally systemic and holistic approach, which requires collaboration, considers the environment, promotes local production, centers on the importance of nutrients, and integrates the values of social justice and equity. We are certain that through this model, we can help to heal our bodies, our community, and our world. Mahalo. Does anyone have questions? Okay, so initially what we did um, at the Wellness Center is we were actually using plates where we were washing it, but I don't know if anybody knows my husband, Kevin Vaccarello, who is the founder of Sustain Hawaii, who is, who is Mr. Sustainability in the state. Um, he did tons of research relative to that, and what we found out was the amount of water that we was actually wasting um, was uh, not as cost effective and eco-friendly as buying compostables. So interestingly enough, um, it was a weird quandary that we had to decide upon. Uh, compostable uh, utensils and plates and all that stuff, it's better than styrofoam and all that other thing. So being the wellness center and serving food, we had to make a choice. And so we thought because, especially in Hawaii with sometimes our water issues, especially for farmers, we had to take that into consideration. So that's one of the things that we chose to do. Um, interestingly enough, the, the compostable units that we use uh, are car corn polymer types of uh, utensils, so they break down. Um, the the um, plates also break down, and so it's taken to H power and it's turned into energy. So that's, that's wonderful. Um, we actually have it special ordered from a person here that brings it in for us, yeah. Okay, so the first question was how I was influenced to be vegan, and the second was um, how do the Hawaiians respond when I, when I talk to them about vegan food. Um, initially for me, I've been vegetarian for, God, I, I can't even remember the last time I had meat. Um, and I was, I was fortunate because, and this is really weird, but I was fortunate because I didn't like the taste of meat. So it wasn't necessarily, oh yeah, it was because of the health reasons. It was more like, I, it was blood, and I was like, Ugh. And I grew up on a farm. My grandmother and my grandfather had a pig farm, and so that kind of really turned me off, hearing the pigs squealing and all that stuff. And so that was kind of an influencer for me. But then as I was delving deeper into the research, particularly when we got hired by the Department of Agriculture to do the assessment on Hawaii's food system, I really started to see the impact of food, not only on the degradation of our environment, but on our bodies. And so even more so, I became passionate about it. Um, and that led me down the path to being full vegan. Um, in regards to the Native Hawaiians, it is sometimes a challenge, but I think what's helpful is I have a team. Um, the woman that I work with, her name is Dr. Maile Tawali'i. She is the public health indigenous person that started the master's program over at UH. Um, and she's an epidemiologist and a brilliant Native Hawaiian woman. And together we work in tandem also with Ramsey Tom, who is a Ho'oponopono practitioner. 
um, and we go kind of in force, you know, and we talk to our Hawaiian people. And fortunate for me is they're very, very much in alignment with the culture and they know it very well. And so when we come upon other Native Hawaiians that go, bah, vegan, no, that we don't eat like that, you know, it's like, I, I can be non akuli okay? So <laughs> I'll be like, no, absolutely not. Because in reality, let's look at our history. Let's look at what our ancestors, how they ate, you know, and, and, I, and it's education. And it's reminding them that this is actually taking your power away. The, you eating unhealthily and dying at disproportionate numbers of diabetes, heart disease, and all this other stuff, you're giving your power away again. And so once we start to really educate and we start to remind them of who we truly are as people, then they become a little bit more open-minded. And also, the reason why we think that um, it works is because we have integrated the Ahupua'a system, the community-based system where we have people accountable, where when they're done and they graduate from the program, they actually invite their family member or friend. So then they act as a mentor, so they get stoked, because they're like, I want to call them, I want to say, hey, bro, I know you're having a hard time, but let me come over, you know? And granted, we do, we have parties at our house, we invite them up, you know, but it's all vegan food. And a lot of times they're really shocked, they're like, really, this is vegan? No way. So it's education, constantly education and having the partnerships that I have. Absolutely. The last book that I read that just moved me, which I think is super crucial that anybody that's interested in this should read, is Dr. Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die. That book is nuts. It's so, so good. Um, and I watch all his DVDs. Uh, we also partnered with Dr. Katz out of um, Yale University. He's a doctor there. Um, if you want to YouTube him, Dr. Katz, David Katz is his name. He's remarkable. He does a lot of TED Talks. Uh, he's a friend of ours, and he directs us a lot. Um, and he, like I said, he's a medical doctor out of Yale. Super brilliant. So those are the types of materials for sure that I would absolutely read like now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much again for being here. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Mahalo to everyone for coming tonight, and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone. <laughs>